Welcome to part two of the Heathkit AP1800 preamplifier series. In part one, I told you a bit about the history of Heathkit's Pro Series components, and we unboxed our new old stock, 40-year-old unbuilt kit. In this multi-part series, we'll build, fully test, and demonstrate the preamplifier. Let's start putting it together. Okay, let's flip through the manual and get to the first section. See what we need to do first. Okay, here we go. The speaker selector, input selector, mode selector, circuit boards. Okay, and it says we need to get pack number one. And I have that here. It's pack number one. And to make things simple, I'm going to dump everything we need for this stage. into this container and you can see it's mostly switches let's set that aside and we're also going to need uh, part 852058 which is the speaker selector circuit board and that's this piece here let's set that aside we'll also need part 852144 which is the input selector circuit board and that's this one here set that aside and finally, part 852059, which is the mode selector circuit board. And that's this guy here. Great, let's begin. I've barely begun to put the kit together and I've already run into an issue. I was working on putting this mode selector board together and there's supposed to be a two position switch here, a three position switch here, and a four position switch here. And these correspond to the front panel controls for the adapter, two positions, tape monitor, one, two, three, three positions, and the record mode, one, two, three, four positions. Now, unfortunately, my kit does not include a three position switch for the tape monitor. Instead, I have a two position for the adapter, a four position for record mode, and an additional four position switch. Now, the four position switch does fit on the board, and you can see I've temporarily installed it here. And fortunately, my tests show that it will actually work in this position without a problem. That's why I've done this diagram here and have been doing some continuity tests on the switch. So I'm going to go ahead and just use the four position switch. It is going to create some odd behavior on the front panel though because this tape monitor will now be able to switch into the sort of zero position. You'll be able to go to two, source, or one, but you'll also be able to turn it further counterclockwise to this position. But I've confirmed that putting the switch into this position will not cause any troubles with the circuit. And the four position switch will correctly switch between source, one, and two on the tape monitor. If any of you have this preamplifier, please let me know. Does your tape monitor switch into four positions or does it have just the three? I'm wondering if they made a mistake with mine and included the wrong switch, or they just ran out of three position switches and put the four position switch in there instead. Let me know in the comments. I just wanted to note that I am going to make a small modification when I solder the switch to the board. Now, as I said, with the four position switch inserted here, I'm going to be able to switch beyond this number one position. So to prevent the circuit from going open, I'm going to put a jumper between these two pins and these two pins. And that's because when the switch is in its most counterclockwise position, it actually switches to this pin here. Now, if I connect it to this pin here, it will connect it to the number one position. And now this is a stereo switch, so this is for one channel and the same for here. This position is for the most counterclockwise position and this is for the number one position. So by soldering a jumper between these two pins and these two pins, when we go all the way counterclockwise, it will actually stay still connected to number one for the source. <music> That completes the build for the speaker selector, input selector, and mode selector circuit board section. Here's our completed speaker selector board, our completed input selector board, and our completed mode selector board. Let's move on and see what's next.
put these aside. Okay, next we have the power supply circuit board. For this, we need to locate pack number two, and I have that here. Let's put the contents into this container, just to make things more convenient as we're building. Okay, quite a few parts. This section will be a little more involved than the last. Let's put the parts aside. And let's see, we're also going to need part number 852143, which is the power supply circuit board, and I have that here. Here we go. Okay, let's begin. Here's our completed power supply board. Everything came together pretty smoothly. I tested every component on the board and everything checked out. And as I said in part one, I didn't use the electrolytics that came with the kit. These are newer ones that I purchased and uh, some of these I actually had in stock. I've double checked everything and everything seems to be in order and I've cleaned up the foil side as well. So we can set this aside now and let's flip ahead and see what's next. Okay, next we're going to do the move and coil circuit board. And for that, we'll need pack three. Let's get that, I have that right here. And as usual, dump everything into our container to make things easy. And yep. This is the pack that has the tantalums in it. I've got new tantalums to use as well, so I won't be using these. And let's see, the board that we require will be Part number 852142, the moving coil circuit board. And that's this guy right here. Let's build it. I'm just wrapping up the construction of the moving coil board. And as I'm showing you the construction of these boards using a time lapse, things are obviously going by very quickly. And I just wanted to clarify a couple of the techniques that I'm using. First of all, you may be noticing that I'm testing each component before it's installed using my uh, peak meters and others. This is just to verify that before the component goes into the board, we know that it's operating correctly. As I said in the first video, an especially good idea given that these components are over 40 years old. And again, I'm not using the electrolytic capacitors that came with the kit, these are all new, but I'm testing these as well before they're installed. So testing components before you install them is a good idea whether those components are new or old. When we fire up this preamp for the first time, we're gonna to wanna to make sure everything is working and we don't want to be wondering if a component that we installed was bad. If we do have problems, we'll at least know that we've checked all the components and that the failure is most likely not due to a faulty component, but because we installed it incorrectly or because there's a soldering problem or other type of issue. Without testing the components, that's just one more thing to have to worry about. You may also notice that when I install the diodes and transistors, I'm using a heat sink before soldering them. 
Diodes can be damaged by the heat of the soldering iron when they're installed, and let's remember that transistors are nothing more than diodes packaged into one unit. The diodes and transistors on this board are of the type that should be able to be installed without using the heat sink if good technique is used when soldering. Nonetheless, I still use the heat sink just for peace of mind. On this board, I've left a couple of the transistors unsoldered to show you how I do this. Let's start with this transistor. Oh, and by the way, these PC board holders are very, very useful when soldering, so highly recommend it. Okay, now I'm going to attach the heatsink clip to the emitter of this transistor. Now what that will do is, as I apply heat on the other side, the heat before it goes into the transistor is going to be captured by the large metallic area of the heatsink, thereby protecting the transistor. Let's turn it over and I'll show you how. Now, as some of you may not have a lot of experience with soldering, let's quickly review good soldering technique. This is the lead we're going to solder right here. What you don't want to do is to put your iron directly on the board at this point. Instead, the first thing to do is to melt a little solder to the tip of your soldering iron, quickly apply it to the pad, and then feed some additional solder from the other direction. This will create a nice solid bond and will result in a very shiny solder ball, indicating a good connection. Here we go. Add a little solder there, feed from the other direction, simple as that. I'm going to clean my tip. Let's do it again on this one. Add a little solder to the pad, perfect. A little solder quickly to the pad, feed from the other direction, flows, perfect. Okay, the only mistake I made was I forgot to put the heat sink on the other terminals on this one. Let's check the transistor and see how hot it is. Yeah, not too bad. Let's do it right this time. Okay, first I'm gonna connect it to the collector. That's this terminal here. Let's solder this transistor. A little solder, a little heat. Let it flow, nice. Flip it over. Attach our heat sink to the base of the transistor. That's this middle one here. Add a little solder, pad, add a little more for the other side, and the solder just flows beautifully around that. Turn it around. Finally, to the emitter of this transistor. See if that stays on, yep. Okay, again, a little bit of solder, attach it to the pad, and from the other side, feed a little more solder and let it flow. Beautiful, when we're done, Remove our heat sink, trim our leads. And we're good to go. Now this board went together smoothly. The only trouble I had was this particular resistor here was not included in the kit. So I had to check the resistors I had in stock and fortunately I had the correct value. So that's what you see here. And strangely, the pack for this particular board did not include the correct resistor here, but I got a couple of bonus resistors here for values that go who knows where. So when you build a Heathkit kit, these are the types of things you might run into. Let's flip this over again and I'll show you the foil side. As you can see, everything looks good. The connections are nice and shiny. When soldering though, the flux from the solder will leave residue on the board. And if you've seen my previous videos, you know I like to remove the residual flux. It can get in the way when testing these components, and some believe it can cause damage over the years. Let me get my flux remover pen and get to work. So I find these pens work pretty good. Uh, this one is by Tex Spray. There are other brands available as well. And the way it works is you depress the tip down and that releases the cleaning chemical. And the brush also has an abrasive quality so you can then use it to sort of work at removing all that residual flux. Now this does have an odor to it that probably isn't healthy for you. So it's a good idea to use a mask when you're doing this. I'm going to put a mask on now, and I'm also going to turn on the fume extractor. Let's begin. Thank you. 
Now you might be tempted to use a cotton swab to clean off this residue, but just don't do it. The tips of these soldering connections can be very sharp and they're just gonna pull all the strands out of this cotton and you're gonna have a mess on your hands. If you do wanna use a swab, use a lint-free one like this instead. And you can see, you can sort of dab that around. Now you notice that the flux remover pen has loosened the flux, but it's still on this board. So I'm just sort of just spreading it around now. And you can see the deposits here on the swab. I'm just gonna keep going over this to remove as much as I can. And that works pretty well, but you can see the board is now getting very sticky. That's because again, we haven't really removed the flux. So you've just sort of shifted around and picked up a little bit on the swab. So what I'm going to do now is use a little bit of this MG Chemical Safety Wash, and I'm going to spray the whole board down and let it drip away. And I'm just doing this on my bench and letting it drip. And this will further loosen up that sticky flux and cause it to drip below the board where we can just wipe it up later with a towel. Now you may need to do this a couple times to get the board really clean. I'm going to now use a microfiber towel. Again, don't use anything that has lint on it because it's just gonna create a mess. And I'm just gonna dab that up and you can see, yes, it's looking much better. Excellent. Yeah, not that sticky at all anymore. Just dabbing at it, looks good. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good as it is, but I'm gonna give it one more spray with the MG Chemical Safety Wash. Let that drip down. Let's take a look at the other side of the board. You can see it's getting a little wet too as well. We can just dab that up. And flip it over again and dab this side, the foil side. Okay, looks good. And to clean the component side up, I've gotten a clean swab and I'm just gonna go through here and gently pick up that moisture. Okay, good, let's check out the other side. Excellent, not sticky at all. There we go, our completed moving coil circuit board. Let's go to our manual and see what's next. Okay, looks like next we'll be working on the main circuit board. And for that, we're going to need pack number four, which is actually two packs, number one and number two. Let's pour out the components for pack A first, set pack B aside, get our Tupperware. And let's see, what do we have? Okay, we've got some switches and the potentiometers. Put those aside and pack B we have, ooh, lots of parts. Uh, I think we're gonna need a bigger boat. Let me get a bigger tub here, okay. Try that instead. Yeah, lots of parts. Okay, and let's see the board we need. We're going to need part number 852359, which is the main circuit board, and I have that here. Here we go. Okay, let's start putting this together, but let's do it in the next video. Stay tuned for part three, where we'll continue the build of our Heathkit Pro Series preamplifier. To stay updated, please subscribe and click the bell. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.